Today, we're going to talk about the supernatural and the harvest. This is a church that, if we can put that back up, that Q code back up. Some people were taking pictures. But this, the supernatural and the harvest, this is a church that I believe wants to reach people who are ready. You say, well, how do we know where they're ready? When you're ready, they're ready. I found that to be true. When I'm ready to win souls, they're there. <laughs> it's not like I have to look hard. They're there. And so God is preparing us. He's prepared us with his word. And so I want to talk about uh, our scripture, first of all, Matthew 21, verse 21. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, you have faith and do not doubt. Not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. Well, we don't know that Jesus did a big mountain thing, but we do know he cursed a fig tree and it died. When you compare a fig tree to a mountain, which one's bigger? Yeah, Jesus said, you think that's big? What you guys are going to do is going to blow this fig tree away. So much bigger of what he's called us to do. So not only can you do what Jesus did, you are to do the things he was never able to do. His ministry was only three years. He was raised in a hole in the ground. We, f we figured that out. What good could come out of Nazareth? The church didn't like him. They crucified him. There was no organized spiritual church, just religion. There was not travel like we know it today. The furthest he went was when he was a child to Egypt, and he ventured into Samaria because he wanted to minister to the Samaritan woman. But other than that, Jesus didn't travel very far. He said, greater works you are going to do. John 14, 12 says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Anything you ask in his name according to his will, he will do. I think the problem is we're not asking enough. We settle. We just put up with stuff. He said, ask in my name, and I will do it. He said, whoever believes in me, who's a believer in Jesus today? Raise your hand. So if you raised your hand, whoever believes in me will do the works I've already been doing. So that's very easy. Whoever believes in Jesus will never thirst again. Whoever believes in Jesus, out of their heart will flow live, uh, rivers of living water. Whoever believes in Jesus, though they die, they will live. And whoever believes in Jesus will not remain in darkness. That, that's just the normal stuff that the neurotypical Christian is supposed to do. We're supposed to live an overcoming life of joy. So again, it says, very truly I tell you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and then even greater works. I love that. I love the, the greater works that Jesus, that he's not, a, a, he's not intimidated. Now, that creates a problem for me, though. I come to a praxis when I look at what Jesus did and then he tells me greater things. Because let's look at this. This creates a problem when we think of the amazing miracles Jesus performed. Water to wine was his first miracle. Read the mind of the woman of Samaria, healed the official son, healed the crippled man of 38 years, fed the 5,000 with five loaves and fishes, and, and two fishes, walked on water, healed a man born blind, raised Lazarus from the dead. This is just a few of the things that Jesus did. And here he's saying, to those who believe, do what I already do. This, this is just your normal practice. This is what you are called to do. Whoever believes in me will also do the works I do. Now, let's, let's talk about this. He did all these great things. He raised, raised the dead. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. What was Jesus unable to do that he wants us to do? So, I, uh, before pandemic, um, the last trip I was on was in Bangladesh with uh, Dr. Marilyn Hickey. We did some really neat stuff with the denominational leaders there. In fact, we prayed that uh, God would impact them. We had all the denominational leaders of Bangladesh gathered. They said in this conference, you're going to do anything except speak on 
uh, praying in tongues. So uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we're like, fine. Last night they came and said, you know what? It's been so good. Could you just speak on that? <laughs> yes. And we saw several of those denominational leaders baptized in the Holy Spirit that night. So, you know, that, that's great. Like you said, there wasn't the, the advent of the Holy Spirit yet. And praying in tongues. I love to pray in tongues. Don't y'all? Stand up. I know you did it in worship, but this is something the disciples weren't able to do. Um, pray in tongues right now. Come on, just begin to pray in tongues. You're doing something that the disciples didn't have while Jesus was here on earth. Wow, wasn't that beautiful? Would you just lift your hands and worship to him right now? Just love on him. Wow. We worship in spirit and truth. Mm. Worship in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, Father. Bless you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a, what a holy moment. What a holy moment. Wow. I, I just sense God is smiling right now. Wow. You can be seated this morning. The things that we're able to do today, the disciples weren't able. Right here, what you just did when Jesus was here on earth. They didn't sit around. They didn't have services. They didn't have a church to go to to have the freedom to then experience God, experience the things of the Spirit, and go out into the world. The churches they went to were synagogues and didn't even believe in Jesus. So the Lord has opened up a new era. COVID, what the enemy meant for harm, God has used for good. How many of you are Zoomed out? Yeah. But you know what? Thank God we learned to do some things different. Um, it was three years ago I was in Pakistan, and pa Pakistan is about 2% Christian, but the last service I did there was for 300,000 Muslims. We had at least 100,000 in one night except Christ. Signs, wonders, and miracles, powerful. God is doing a work. But then pandemic shut things down, and it's just getting started. So next year, I'll be going back to Pakistan. We'll be going to, to minister in Egypt, Honduras, Costa Rica, Bangladesh. A lot's happening in 23, but we're just getting back in the groove. So I had a pastor friend who said, would you preach in Pakistan next week? I was like, are you kidding me? I'm No, <laughs> I'm not going to Pakistan. He goes, you know what? We're, we're, we've adapted. We put a big screen up, and would you preach our Wednesday night service? We'll have 40,000 people there just minister, and let's see what Jesus does. So at 8 o'clock at my office, sitting at my desk, I had a simple sermon to share with them with a translator. Here's what happened. We're going to check this out. The first thing we're going to pray for is stiffness and neck. If you are having a problem with your neck, I want you to stand right now. And as I begin to pray, I want you to begin to move your neck. At the beginning, it may hurt. So take your right hand and place it on your neck. And ask Jesus to begin to heal your neck. In the name of Jesus, I ask that every neck be healed. That any damage to the neck would go away. Next, we're going to pray for tumors and growths. If you have a tumor or a growth on your body, I want you to stand. I have seen many people healed of tumors and growths, and Jesus wants to heal you tonight. So place your right hand wherever you have this growth or this tumor, and let's pray together right now. Jesus, would you heal these tumors and these growths? This is not part of your plan for their life. So in the name of Jesus, I command every growth and tumor to go away. We're going to have testimonies in a few minutes, and I believe we're going to have testimonies of healed necks and healed tumors because God is so good. The next thing we're going to pray for is your eyes. If you have blindness in, in one eye or both eye, I want you to stand. So place your hand on whichever eye is blind. 
and I'm going to pray by faith that you will receive your sight. This is not difficult for Jesus. It's simply what he does. It's part of God's plan for your life. So Jesus restores sight right now. And those who are blind cause these eyes to see again. I believe we're going to hear testimonies of people who can see now. Now I want to pray for feet. In particular, we're going to pray for arches to be restored in feet. So Jesus, would you heal feet tonight? Would you restore arches into their feet? There's one more thing, one more word of knowledge the Lord has given me. He wants to heal the wrist up through the hands. Jesus is going to heal hands tonight, fingers and wrists. As I begin to pray, I want you to begin to exercise your hands and move your hands. Jesus, just like you healed my wrist, I ask you to heal wrist, hands, and fingers right now. Pastor John, this is a wonderful testimony. She had a pain in her body. She had a tumor in her hand. Uh, Pastor John, there's, there were three problems. She had a pain, and she had a tumor in her hand, and she was blind by her eyes, the blinded. She was, wasn't able to see the things clearly. But God has healed her Amen. from the tumor as well as from the blind eyes. Let's give a big wow. hand for the Jesus Christ. And there was a lady, uh, we'll stop it here, a lady that uh, swallowed tumors as we were praying. Jesus didn't get to do this. I'm sitting at my desk at 8 o'clock in the morning, and continents away, people are getting healed. It's a new day. It's an exciting time. I did feel like Philip. I felt like I was translated right there. So we're going to talk about the commission, what Jesus is calling us to do. The pre-commission, Mark 16, 14. Jesus appeared to the leaven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of of faith. That's what your pastor's wife said, unbelief. So they had some unbelief and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him even after he had risen. So the first thing that we have to do is really believe that anything is possible with Jesus. So this pastor came back to me and said, okay, now we want you to do it once a month. I said, I'm on, I'm on. And, uh, you know, that was fun. I'm learning to do things differently than I've done before, and I'm learning to, to question, Jesus, what is it that you were not able to do? What's the mountain? You did the fig tree. What's the mountain? What's the bigger? Because every parent wants their kids, every good parent wants their kids to do better things and bigger things than they did. Now, I've met some rotten parents who tear their kids down. Jeremiah 29, 11 refutes that. He has a plan for you that is good. He's never against you, always for you. He has a hope and a future for your life. That's the father we have. So our father says, you're going to do bigger things than I did. Wow, the God of the universe says, you're going to do bigger things than my son did here while he was here on earth. Is he intimidated by that? No, that's why Jesus came, so you could do the next. And I believe God is speaking to you today that there are some mountains that need to be moved. And Jesus isn't going to move them. He didn't move mountains. He cursed fig trees. You're mountain movers. You're the people, you're the generation that is to move the mountains. So the pre-commission, Jesus was saying, what you have to do is simply believe. Then the commission was simply the bare minimum for the church, Mark 16, 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. If you're a believer in Jesus, stand to your feet right now. You say, I believe in Jesus. Yeah. So this is to you. This is the bare minimum basement that you're supposed to be doing. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up, pick up snakes with their hands if you have to. They will drink deadly poison if it's served. It will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. This is just the normal Christian life. 
So tell Jesus right now in your own way, I'm ready to just be normal, first of all. I'm ready to do the normal stuff. Lord, I'm, re I'm ready to cast out demons. If somebody presents poison to me and tricks me, I'm going to, when I find out, say, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live and not die. I will speak with new tongues. I will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I thank you, God. You're for me, not against me. This is the normal thing you've called me to do, and I will do it. I will do it. So I want you to realize before you do the next, you have to do the normal. I've heard people in my church say, we have lottery in Texas. Pastor, is it okay if I play the lottery? I promise I'll tithe off of it. And I'm thinking, Joker, you don't even tithe now. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? Make sound investments in the kingdom. Quit wasting your time on fairy tales. You know, you say, I'm going to do great things for the Lord, but you're scared of demons. I'm going to do the miraculous. And so somebody limps up to you and you're like, you walk away. When are you going to do it? This is the normal. And we have to do the normal to get ready for the mountains. So put your hand on your heart. Repeat after me. Father, I thank you for the commission. This is the normal working orders. To heal the sick. Cast out demons. Speak in new tongues. Not be afraid of the enemy's agenda. I'm preparing to move mountains in Jesus' name. Come on, lift your hands and tell him that right now. We're mountain-moving people. We're not afraid of the enemy. We're not afraid of demons. We're not afraid to pray for the sick. We're not afraid to speak in tongues. We are your mountain movers. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay, you can be seated. That's fun. I was in Honduras in uh, July. Was doing a pastor's conference there, and pandemic was particularly cruel to them. Many, many, many pastors died because they are all out of the Catholic Church. And so when somebody gets sick, they want their priest to come and pray for them, and they want their Pentecostal pastor to come. And so those pastors would stay with the COVID patients, pray, get sick, and die. It happened over and over. Their families got infected. Their wives died. Their kids died. They lost so many people in COVID. And so there was a, a depression and a heaviness on these pastors and their wives. We invited their kids. We had 30 salvations of preachers' kids. 15 of their teens received baptism of the Holy Spirit and prophecy. Isn't that great? But they were coming out of a cave, and they were sad. And the first night, we, we had them pray they were, they were praying like this, like they had hung their harps on the willows. And so I just challenged them like I'm challenging you. It's like, you got to get in this. The next morning, I asked them to come early for breakfast, before breakfast, and pray with me. I got there at the appointed time, but they were already there. And here's what was going on. I want to show you this video. This was before breakfast. The night before, they were sad and quiet. But when the Holy Spirit broke through, it broke some bondage. Isn't that great? Yeah. So we, we brought the police department in. I want to show you this picture. In Katakamas, Katakamas is the most dangerous part of Honduras. One of our pastors, we planted nine churches there. One of our pastors was shot by a drug dealer a few months ago. But we brought the police department in. And we, I asked these pastors, these, these pastors are really poor bivocational pastors. Our church paid for them all to come to the conference. But uh, we took up an offering. They gave two years' salary out of them to the police department. In that service, these policemen were Catholic. Well, they were so pumped up, the pastors. They were praying in tongues over the policemen, hands everywhere. And these guys were just standing there like that. It was fantastic. When Jesus gets released... Powerful things happen. Yeah. One of the leaders, he, he talked to me. There's a red box around my shoes. He said, Pastor, I see your wisdom. He said, you know, to get our people to do what they need to do and to pray in the Spirit again and to have joy again and, and the signs and wonders and things we haven't seen and done. He said, you know, I see your wisdom. You, you wore jeans with holes in them and you rolled up your, your, your jeans and you didn't wear socks. So that's what they talked about. I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, okay. 
That deflected off of religion's anger. Religion wants to hold you down. And when signs and wonders start happening, when miracles start occurring, oh, that's not Jesus. So just wear something crazy, I guess. <laughs> so the effects of the ongoing commission. We had pre-commission where there was doubt. The commission where the normal life of believers casting out demons, speaking in new tongues, raising the dead, healing the sick. Mark 16, 19. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied. So the disciples then began to do the book of Acts with the help of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we're still finishing the book of Acts right now. We're living it. Uh, someone said we are the, we're the generation, we're the church right here that is going to see these things through. I believe that. And, you know, I'm not worried about the, the financial climate at all. I'm, I'm glad. We're, we're Today at our church we have... Uh, 40 former drug addicts that are visiting from Life Challenge. We have 15 homeless people from the street that we brought in. We set up showers. We have washing machines. Six people are cutting hair. We're just helping people wherever they're at and however we can. You know, the church is called to do that kind of stuff. So I like what you're doing in raising money and preparing and getting ready. I say this recession has been very, very good to me because I don't worry about it. I continue to give. My wife and I are giving more than we've ever given before in our lives. And as you continue to sow, as you continue to, to give, as you tithe, it's miraculous what God will do in your finances.